Welcome to this week in Missouri politics. We are joined by a very special guest. We're going to jump right into the show. Former Senator Roy Blunt, welcome to This Week in Missouri Politics. Hey, Scott. Great to be with you. It is an honor to be joined by one of the greatest Missouri statesmen. You left the Senate uh, around this time last year. What have you been up to? Well, I've been pretty busy. I've been uh, giving advice to people, and they've been taking it. I'm serving on a couple of boards. Uh, I'm serving on three boards that are really volunteer boards that I, I like a lot and enjoy a lot. But uh, trying to, you know, the, I haven't missed the Senate. I love the Senate. I loved what I was able to do for four decades and felt so fortunate to be able to do it and felt pretty fortunate to be able to leave when I wanted to leave. And uh, you know, this next chapter is uh, fun and uh, I'm kind of a next chapter guy, so uh, I'm looking forward to what happens. We had a great year last year and so uh, now I'm starting my second year out of the Senate and enjoying it. So I always enjoyed hearing you talk about international affairs. Uh, whenever you come on this show or mm -hmm. others. It is, uh, boy, it just feels like one of the more complicated times internationally in my lifetime. Let's start with the thing that's at the top of the news, what's happening in Israel and Gaza right now. Uh, what's your take on the situation? You probably get a little better intel than I do. Well, you know, I, actually, I, I'm, I'm one of the, my free jobs, I kept my security clearance, and so I'm, I still have the same security clearance that I had when I was on the Intelligence Committee. I think generally everything you see about this is pretty obvious. Uh, I've been to Israel a lot of times. For a decade, I took the new freshman Republican members. Uh, we do that after the election, so in the odd-numbered year, we in August uh, go to Israel for a few days, and that was always exciting to see people who uh, all their lives had heard about Bethlehem and Nazareth and the Sea of Galilee and the yeah. Dead Sea actually see those things and see how small that country really is. You know, that Israel would fit in, in uh, Missouri eight or ten times. And um, so that was exciting. I, I think what's happened in Israel that concerns Israelis the most is that security was one of the things they really depended on their government for. Mm -hmm. And this is, there's nothing quite like this has happened, uh, certainly not in the last 50 or 60 yeah. years. But nothing like this has, has happened, and I think it's created a lot of concern in a way that Israelis thought they were beyond this kind of problem uh, and hoping to see the development of uh, better relationships with their neighbors. Uh, oddly, the, the relationships with the neighbors seem not to have been disrupted very much by this. Uh, the UAE, this, you know, Saudi Arabia, uh, Jordan have had different levels of interaction as has Egypt with Israel. That appears to, it appears to be a lot of desire not to step back to where uh, those countries were with Israel 20 years ago. At some point, though, if you're Jordan, you're out of the area of Emirates, it's not in your interest anymore. I know this is the oldest war in the world and may never mm -hmm. find peace, but it's really not in that country's interest at some point to continue this fight, right? I think it's not in their interest, but it's probably also not in their interest to not complain about mm -hmm. what's happening in Gaza. You know, and Israel is faced with a difficult situation there. My guess is that Hamas uh, this, thought this is likely to be exactly what would happen. Yeah. Uh, they'd do an outrageous attack uh, in, in, with a series of outrages against individuals. They'd seize hostages. Uh, Israel would react as Israel would have to react. And then the world would begin to say, well, what, what's Israel keeping this going on for? And of course, one of the reasons they want to keep doing some of what they're doing is to eliminate Hamas as an active force and an enemy essentially in the heart of the country. I hear people talk about it's went on too long. I remember 9-11 happened when I was in college. My entire professional life mm -hmm. until a year ago, mm -hmm. the United States was still at war in Afghanistan. I mean, we still had a military presence there. So I mean, it took 20 years to go in to Afghanistan after 9-11. What's it been, four months now? It's been since October. Yeah. I don't think Israel has 20 years or yeah. even 20 months. This is a small piece of ground. They need to figure out what they're doing with it. They need to eliminate the Hamas network in every way they can. Uh, but then they need to realize that there are a lot of people that live in Gaza uh, that while they're not openly opposed to Hamas, they're not part of Hamas and really don't have much choice. And, and I think that's what the Israeli government will eventually do. But I'm not criticizing them for wanting to get the job done before they move on to what happens next. Ukraine, it seems to fall on the back burner a little bit. It surprised me. Democrats are now more anti-Israeli than ever. 
And now you're seeing some Republicans that are extremely anti-funding Ukraine. How long can Ukraine hold on? Well, Ukraine can't hold on for long without our yeah. help. Now, the, you know, to our, in many cases, to the surprise of, of Americans, including Americans in the government, uh, the um, EU and NATO have both stepped up in significant ways to try to stabilize the economy, to try to provide the individual economic and, and uh, humanitarian assistance that clearly you need if you're well into the second year now of an aggressive war by a bigger, uh, by a bigger opponent than you are. Uh, but I'm, I'm a big supporter of what we've been doing with Ukraine. Don't have a vote to cast in the Congress uh, anymore. But I, I do think that if we let Putin get away with this, you've got a whole series of countries that are on the line next, starting with Moldova, mm -hmm. uh, the three little Balkan countries, Balkan countries, while they're in better shape, than they've ever been before because of the addition, the shocking to Putin addition of Finland and Sweden to NATO. Suddenly you've got very capable NATO partners and that's a different situation yeah. than Ukraine. I mean, these, these countries uh, are part of NATO. We have a commitment to them through NATO, but so now do Finland and Sweden and Norway. So you've got lots of help, much closer than help in many ways has ever been to those really small countries that Putin has had his eye on from day one. I, I've been in all those countries. I don't think I've ever been in um, uh, those countries when, at least in one of them, Putin wasn't within a month of practicing yeah. the invasion <laughs> of Estonia or the invasion of Latvia or the invasion of Lithuania. He's just constantly letting them know that I want you, we want you back as, as a part of the Soviet Union, even though the Soviet Union, part of Imperial Russia, uh, would be more appropriate maybe to say. I think it's hard for most Americans to fathom what it would be like for a major military power to be running military exercises about invading New Madrid. I think that's impossible to really live and right. understand that perspective unless you right. live that life. And you know, we've had, we've had several units over there, A-10 units particularly from uh, Whiteman, that were part of that revolving effort to always have some American presence in those three countries with the belief, and I think the proper belief, that Putin would be much more reluctant uh, to run into a fight that involves Americans than he would to run into a fight that was only Estonians yeah. or Eastern Europeans. Let's talk about it. I, you know, it's probably fortunate that Eric Schmidt's 6'6". I don't think you could have had bigger shoes to fill than yours. How's he doing? Well, I think he's doing well. I think he's doing well. He, uh, he, he's taking on some issues that Missourians care about and issues that uh, need attention. Uh, he's a smart guy. I've always thought he had a lot to offer as a public official, and I think he's doing that every day as a senator. I noticed he started producing uh, some resources for uh, Fort Leonard Wood and Whiteman. I thought mm -hmm. that was very important. He's got that position on armed service. I thought he's He's actually bringing home some very much needed resources from national security, but for Missouri. Yeah, that's a great job for a Missourian to have too, because the national security, both in terms of the bases, um, Whiteman, Fort Leonard Wood, uh, what happens at Rosecrans uh, in, uh, uh, in near, at, at St. Joseph, all important. Plus, we have, we're a big defense provider, and not just Boeing in St. Louis, the Boeing defense effort in St. Louis, but lots of defense providers of various levels from cyber uh, to robotic uh, defense issues uh, are based in Missouri. And having somebody on the uh, Armed Services Committee that understands those what they do and understands how that matters to the defense of the country, really helpful to, uh, to our state. And frankly, it's helpful to the defense of the country having somebody advocating for those important parts of how we defend the country. You can kind of understand where he came is coming from right now. Is you filled some pretty big shoes in the United States Senate? I mean, is there a more accomplished Missourian than Kit Bond? What was that like to take over his job? Well, he's he served Missouri in ways wow. that are extraordinary, both as governor and in the Senate. Uh, a, a great partner to to our state. He he was in so many ways the Missouri senator. Yeah. always thinking first about our state, second about everything else. But, you know, he was also the top-ranking person on the Intel Committee. So he had a, yeah. he had a broad portfolio of uh, how you serve the country and did it so well. And uh, I still talk to Kit often and 
if I need real advice from yeah. a good advisor, he's still one of the people I call. You're, uh, you're doing some advisory work. You joined the uh, Commission on Presidential Debates. What all goes into that? Well, it's a 10 people. Um, it's a commission that, from a presidential election point of view, is supposed to maintain public neutrality, but clearly it's a balance generally of Democrats and Republicans and people from different walks of, uh, of life. You know, I'm on that commission. The head of the president of Notre Dame is on that commission. There's quite a distance between the president of Notre Dame and I. In fact, I got, a, I got an award a few years ago. Uh, the only person that had previously got it was Bishop Carlson in St. Louis. And I, I said that to my wife, to, to uh, Abby, I said, gee, I, I don't know. The only person that's ever gotten this award is Bishop Carlson. And she said, well, just think of it this way. The person that gets it after you will have a lot less to live up to. So, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's, that's how I'll relate to the president of Notre Dame on to the get, commission on on, right? debates. I hope we have debates. Um, uh, you know, they've already got four sites. The first debate would be uh, in San Marcos, uh, Texas, near 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 Austin, um, on uh, September the 9th. So these debates start pretty quickly. And then there's a vice presidential debate. Then there's a presidential debate scheduled at the first historic black institution to have a debate, Richmond oh. State wow. at Richmond, Virginia. And then the last debate is uh, October the 6th. The good thing about that front-loaded calendar is that so many states start voting so early now yeah. that at least you're not having uh, that important discussion assuming it happens after half the voters have voted or even half of the voters that are going to vote remotely have voted. And so starting September 6th, uh, I don't think uh, President Biden has made a commitment on the debate yet. Uh, President Trump has said he will debate even though he's not a big fan of the uh, presidential debate. He does commission. make it interesting. I mean, I'm not sure if it's good or bad, but he makes it interesting. He, Where is the fi final debate at? Uh, the final debate's in Utah. Now, if I know you, and you're on this commission very long, it would surprise me if the next election, one of those debates is in Missouri. Well, you know, Washington, Washington University had debate, had a number of debates for, I think, about three out of four presidential elections straight, and they were a great host, and uh, Missouri was a great place to cover a debate from. Uh, let's talk about another thing you're doing, the National Geospatial uh, work you're doing. Uh, I, I would say without you and Congressman Clay, that is not in St. Louis right now. Uh, you're continuing your work in that field, right? I am. You know, and we worked hard on that. Lacey and I worked hard on that. Uh, Claire was very involved in that. We had a Democrat and Republican uh, from Illinois that dr definitely wanted that move to, uh, to uh, the uh, air base outside, mm -hmm. you know, 50 miles from where, where they're based right now. And uh, we had a president from Illinois. Uh, yeah. They would have loved to have that $250 million payroll over there. And we got the payroll and we got this new, you know, we're spending $1.8 billion to create a new facility. This is, this is a significant part of our overhead architecture, our geospatial architecture for national security. In fact, remembering when Osama bin Laden uh, was was killed. Uh, it was uh, St. Louis where they were watching him walk every day, wow. where they did the mock-up of what they knew the outside and the guess as to what might be inside when you went through those doors. Uh, these are these people that do really important work for us at a facility that uh, they've been in parts of it for over 75 years, and it's you know it's near the railroad, uh, the the uh, river the brewery, and a chemical site. <laughs> so there are all kinds of reasons that would not be where you'd want that facility. And the new facility is being built in North St. Louis, right at the where pruitt Igo was. Yeah. I think it serves a real economic development opportunity as well. Uh, but I think that whole geo and economy, that whole location science economy, Scott, is going to be a rapidly growing part of the future. Yeah. All the data uh, that you get from overhead, the autonomous vehicles, there are some people that believe that that part of the economy will be the most rapidly growing part of the economy. And maybe now with AI, they would say right after AI, but I've heard more than one person say, uh, this, is the, this is going to grow exponentially. They're still looking for sort of a location to be the hub of that economy. I'm doing everything I can to encourage people 
uh, to look at Missouri, uh, to look at St. Louis, but the University of Missouri in Columbia is involved. Uh, University of Missouri at Rolla, s and is involved. Uh, UMSL's involved, St. Louis University, Washington University. We have great academic support, uh, and I think we also have a lot of community support, particularly in the St. Louis community who are saying, uh, uh, we, we understand this is a big asset for us and we want to make the most of it. Why don't you come here? It's exciting. No. Uh, we have an announcement to make. Uh, our Statesman of the Year this year, an award that Lieutenant Governor Kehoe, Governor Parson, you've won, Caleb Jones, uh, Cinder Rizzo, this year is going to be Senator Cindy Olaf. It's our state's woman of the year. The first time we've been able to honor a woman. Um, just good old Shelby County common sense. Uh, we're very excited. Come out on March 5th uh, at Farm Bureau. We'll be honoring Senator Olaf. We're also going to have our women legislators uh, uh, conference to do their scholarship fundraising. A big fundraising auction at the same time. We're going to honor Senator Olaf. I, I just think if you look at the uh, tone she was able to concoct in the Senate last year, it was a noticeable change, and it took some real statesmanship to try to change that narrative. Yeah, she brings that straightforwardness from Shelby County, just like Norm Stewart did. Yes. And, you know, she tells it like it is, but I haven't watched this as closely as a lot of other people have, but I've watched it closely enough to see that as the floor leader, she has really done her best to try to get done what needed to be done in the way it needed to be done. Senator, thank you so much for the time. We appreciate it. Great to be with you. Plan to join us March 5th over at Farm Bureau. We're honored Senator Cindy Olaf, one of the state's women of the year. We'll be right back with our opinion maker panel after this. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople, while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right-to-work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more. Missourians know that big futures have small beginnings. That's why over 86% of Missouri voters believe early childhood education is essential to success later in life. While almost every voter agrees expanding access to child care will attract jobs and help more parents succeed at work. And more than 7 in 10 Missouri voters say improving early childhood education will make our communities safer. Find out how you can help grow Missouri's bright future at mochampionofchildren.com. We all know puppy mills, cruelty, neglect, and pet store puppies are at high risk for disease, even death. We expect our laws to protect dogs, but now an out-of-state company called Petland is trying to change our state law to enable puppy mill cruelty. We all know it'll hurt the dogs we love. Contact your state legislators. Tell them, protect our dogs. Vote no on the cruelty. Vote no on the harmful puppy mill bill. Data captured by our state-of-the-art monitors helps us pinpoint the timing and location of severe weather more accurately and respond to trouble more quickly. Ameren Missouri's investment in smart technologies like this is one way we're improving reliability and restoring power faster than ever. Responding to trouble before trouble hits. That's energy at work. Ameren, Missouri. Welcome back to This Week in Missouri Politics. We are now joined by Senator Mike Searpoy from Lee Summit. Senator, we had uh, former Senator Blunt on. When he talks, it just sounds like Missouri. Just common sense. He's a good man. We, we miss him. I, I, um, you really think of that Mount Rushmore of Missouri public servants. Kid Bond, obviously. You know, Thomas Hart Benton. I mean, Roy Blunt's right there in that conversation. He certainly is. And I just always appreciate people who you don't read a lot of the headlines about them, but they yeah. just do the hard work because a lot of this is very difficult to get done and they just do it consistently and he's one of those guys that did it I think 14 years in the house and 12 years in the senate you know there's an open congressional race and I tell you I don't I'm not a congressional expert but it looks like one vote here or there doesn't matter much but I'll tell you where it does matter if you're in congress you know you've paid taxes your whole life we all pay taxes every year the federal government's mortgaged our grandchildren's grandchildren's future to China for the amount of money they spend I think it matters that you bring that money home. You should bring our money home. And he's, he did it in spades. I've, I've had arguments with Republicans about the COVID money and some of the mm -hmm. ARPA money. And if I was king, that money would not have been dispersed. Sure. But once it's being dispersed, we should make sure we get our share and bring it back and use it in a smart way. 
So uh, we announced our state's woman this year of the year. It's going to be March 5th at Farm Bureau. Senator Cindy O'Laughlin, someone you know very well. I do. I think it's well, well earned. Cindy has been amazing. And just in full disclosure, I didn't vote for Cindy. Uh, but uh, I, she has done remarkably well. I think she was exactly the right choice. She's got the patience for things that has surprised me. She uh, sometimes, um, some of the things she says <laughs> surprise me, but she has really got insight and patience to get this job done, and it's not an easy job. Very, I think it's the hardest job. I think the floor leader of the Senate is the hardest job in state government because it's very hard to know when to push, when to so back. It is, it, it is incredibly complex. And I, but I tell you what I like about her. Even when she, she made a mistake the other day, she said, oh, she'd kick out Senator Eigel. I don't think she really meant that. No, but the thing about Senator, Senator Laughlin, she's so genuine. Whether she's saying something, you know, profound, whether she's scolding someone, it's it's what she genuinely thought. It's not it a is. game. And I think a person like that that builds up that well of integrity, I mean, it, she she just handles things because she it's almost like a common sense Missourian speaking when she talks. She really does, and just like that, after she tried to unwind that by saying that yep. she, perhaps she misspoke. And that's exactly what I think uh, Cindy's all about. She tries yeah. to do the right thing. And as you know, in the Senate right now, we're dealing with some things that are, um, her, her ideas of getting things moving forward are not joined by everybody in the Senate. And headlines are, are more important to some people, not to Cindy, but to the other team. So it, it is interesting. I mean, essentially you have seven senators that mm -hmm. are kind of in their own mm -hmm. situation, not part of your caucus. Right. Um, you took some chairmanships away in a move that was pretty widely praised, frankly. Mm -hmm. I, I guess, I guess it's at the end of the day, it feels like it's an election year, but it just feels like n anything that gets done, it's just going to be just crawling over glass to get it done. It's going to be hard. I think there's a good chance that's true. Between the FRA fight and the IP fight that's coming up, uh, once we get through those, we'll see if things even out a little bit. And it's crazy because we all want to get the IP done. Every Republican, we did it last year, every Republican voted for IP reform, the current majorities. So there's no disagreement on getting it done. The disagreement is, are we going to do it Tuesday or Thursday? Which seems outrageous to me that we're actually fighting about this. They held us up for 11 days. And, and in fact, on the calendar now, the first thing there is FRA, uh, Senator Huff's FRA. And in the Senate, you got to work them in order. And he's, you know, he's waited 11 days for this chaos to stop. And now he's like, I think we should work on this bill and work our way down the counter. IP is number three. We'll be on it fairly quickly if we just get through them. Let's talk about the, the two issues you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, help me out. I just sit up in the peanut gallery and watch you guys work mm -hmm. on these issues. But to me, if you do concurrent majority, I've heard some lawyers, pro-life lawyers, mm -hmm. Republican folks, mm -hmm. so there's a very good chance concurrent majority won't pass legal muster. It, it seems like a lot of fighting, a lot of effort on something that, that is... I don't think anybody could look at you and say there's a surety that this will be upheld no. by the court. Then you have the realtors. Mm -hmm. One of the most influential groups in this state is willing to come out and hit the IP reform at the ballot box. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think <clears throat> generously it's 50-50 that it actually passes. Then if you put this on in August, won't the governor have to put the abortion IP on in November? Which in your neck of the woods will cost Republicans some seats. I think... I supported the, the IP last year was the time to do IP reform because yes. last year we would have caught this cycle. You this could have adjudicated year, it? Yes. This year, I, I agree, concurrent majorities is a great thing to talk about. It's not done anywhere in the country. I think it's going to be, I'm going to vote for it because I'm not sure, but I think it's going to be ruled unconstitutional because we're going to make some voters more important than other voters. I don't think that'll stand And up. there is no one more pro-life than the Searpoy family no. in Jackson County. No, there's not. The, and other uh, attorneys I know, attorneys that have litigated pro-life cases, they're not, they're not, the concept is fine. They just said they don't think it'll pass no, muster. Do you worry that you're that there's all this fight over something that, frankly, I mean, by state fair, will come to nothing? Yeah, we sadly do this a lot in the, in the pro-life world. Yeah. When we were fighting about the FRA three years ago, remember how much time that took in the seven to one map when the Missouri Right to Life got involved with those? Missouri Right to Life should have been at that point in time. Once they saw Trump getting these Supreme Court judges, everybody knew Roe was going to wind down. They should have been working on a, concurrent, uh, on a uh, IP reform bill back in 16, 17, 18. It should have been done by now. They will till now. The pro-choice people are getting petitions signed. Whatever we pass is not going to be retroactive. The courts rule on that routinely. So collecting signatures under these rules, the election will be under these rules. I'm confident of that. I know there's other lawyers that say maybe not, but between the, the legality of concurrent majorities and the, the ability to be retroactive, I think we're wasting our time on this. It's something we should have done four or five years ago. And if Missouri Right to Life, 
They made us fight about that FRA four years ago, three years ago. Mm -hmm. And since then, they were arguing about money going to, to Planned Parenthood or to affiliated uh, agencies. The amount of money going to Planned Parenthood has gone to zero, and we didn't do what they wanted. So they caused that fight over nothing. Planned Parenthood now gets zero, and now IP reform is the most important thing in the world. It should have been five years ago. To Planned Parenthood, though, because the governor, Senator Huff, yourself, have sat down and worked up, essentially, I'm not going to say you've big governmented Planned Parenthood out, but you kind of have created an environment where they get no state money. Right. right. Uh, they, they just don't. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you're, if you're with Right to Life, would you say, well, we raised the issue and our legislators did respond and now they mm -hmm. get zero money. The problem with that is now you want to pass a law that does effectively nothing. It does effectively nothing. It may also be ruled unconstitutional at some point or illegal. And additionally, if we do an FRA now and put a four-year sunset, either Governor Igel. Governor Kehoe or Governor uh, uh, Ashcroft are going to be in governor's mansion in four and a half years. And they're not going to start changing rules to pl fund Planned Parenthood. So if we pass this for the next four years, uh, and then when the next governor's races come along, if it looks like it may be iffy, maybe look at it more seriously then. But for the next four years, the, the coast is completely clear. Abortion pro providers and affiliated industries are not going to get money well, for this. Yeah, there's nothing to mess with. I mean, if you're just a regular guy driving a truck mm -hmm. in West Plains, or you own a gun store in Kirksville, mm -hmm. I mean, the fact is, your hospital will close. Yeah. If you guys monkey with this and mess this up, FRA the hospital is. closes. The nurse is out of a job. This is not a red meat issue, but it's the most important issue we're going to deal with this year. People, when you need a doctor, we need a hospital. They, especially these rural areas. I'm from Kansas City, Jackson County. Our hospitals are pretty healthy. We have a lot of insured people. But a lot of places in the state are not that way. A lot of these hospitals are really not doing well. And without the FRA, they would, they would be closed in weeks. It is a... Um, it is an interesting time in the Missouri Senate. You tell me, is there a way to break this log jam? Is there a way to get a case of beer out and hash this out and everybody, or, or go out back and fight it out and come out and say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna get these 10 things done. That's what we're gonna get done this year. I, I don't think so, sadly. You know, every year we say the Senate will be better next year. This time I think it actually will because we have uh, three people running for statewide office yeah. and I don't see that winding down. Uh, free media is something that, that they're getting and uh, it will continue, I think. so. Uh, having them quit getting on Facebook and blowing things up is just not in their best interest, I don't think. I mean, there is true. There's, I mean, but there's been politics at play in that there building since the water has been flowing through, <coughs> down the river there past it. it. Uh, interesting times. Well, Senator Zerworth, thank you for joining us, and hope you'll join us on March 5th for our state's Woman of the Year event this year. I'll be there. And also, the Women's Legislative Caucus, we do their scholarship fundraiser, raised $25,000 last year. They can go on my Facebook page. You can bid. Get in that water a little bit. And, uh, and pull out and bid on something for a very good cause. I'll look at that. Thank Please you. Please tell Connie I said hi. I'll do it. We will see you next week for This Week in Missouri Politics. This Week in Missouri Politics is sponsored by the Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, Ameren, Spire, and the United Electric Cooperative.